Thank you, Chairman Nottingham. Um, Mr. Rosenberg, uh, in your comments in developing the CAPM model as an alternative to the DCF approach, you originally endorsed Ibitson, Ibitson's most current estimate of the long-term equity risk premium at 7.1%. Now you say that the, uh, the 5.2% rate calculated by the board appears reasonable. Uh, why the change? And can you reconcile this change in, uh, in change in view? Well, there are several factors. I'd first say that, uh, um, at, at least from my preference, I, I prefer that, that the comment had have, have, have been directed to, to our experts. Uh, but part of it is, is that the uh, original submission was, was put in in, in a, in a, in a uh, compressed time frame, and we wanted to come up with something that was standard and realistic. And, and, and we believe we did that, and we believe it showed that uh, uh, something was seriously uh, uh, amiss in, in what the... Uh, uh, AAR proposed and uh, and uh, what what the board uh, uh, adopted. Uh, since that time, there's obviously been the opportunity to devote more time and more resources uh, 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 to uh, the matter, and, uh, and 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 we thought about things further, and and, and, and that's what I think people uh, should do. Okay. Uh, Mr. Motes, um, it's been test testimony has suggested that we develop a range of uh, estimates and that we choose. Uh, an estimate of the cost of equity at the high end of the range. But doesn't that cause a problem for us in the sense that we have we do have to pass muster with the courts, as uh, Mr. Butchie pointed out earlier. And if you choose the middle of the range, uh, at least that's uh, intellectually safe, uh, even if it's not perhaps the best uh, number. Uh, once you go with, uh, above the median or the mean uh, into some place in the high end, uh, that's causes us to be declared arbitrary and capricious, and it gets sent back saying that you can't do that. Could you, con could you comment on that? <clears throat> yes, uh, that would be a concern, and we'd share it if you were at the very upper end of the range. I, uh, I hope I didn't suggest that you should be, and I know that Professor Myers and Dr. Stangel didn't. Dr. Professor Myers said he would recommend something uh, at least at the middle of the range and a little beyond that would be safer for all the reasons you've heard here today that this is imprecise. It isn't a science. We keep talking about estimates. Uh, you know, the gentleman before from Attica said the investors have their own way of deciding what that number is, but we're talking about it for a very specific known purpose that this agency employs. And in those circumstances, I think you would err a little bit above the middle, but I am not suggesting, I don't think the AAR is suggesting that you go to the very upper end of the range. Um, I would like to make one comment, if I could be permitted, about Mr. Rosenberg's response to your question, on this, because I was going to make this point myself. Twice today, maybe more, at least twice, I heard Mr. Crowley refer to his market risk premium suggestion now of 5.2 as reasonable. He also referred to a 10-year beta as reasonable. Well, and I know people do additional work, <clears throat> Mr. Rosenberg, and I'm not you know, denigrating that effort that they may have changed their views. But we have to recognize that in September, when they put in their opening statement, uh, he described a 7.1 market risk premium, I'm going to quote here, is widely considered the best estimate available. Not a reasonable estimate, the best estimate. Our experts think it is too, and we think Mr. Crowley was right the first time. But I, if I could be permitted to respond, when he talks about our, um, our opening evidence, what I think he's really referring to is, is uh, the Western Coal Traffics League reply. Uh, reply comments on the 2006 cost of capital. And what we were trying to do there, I think was quite explicit, is that we were trying to be consistent with what we had done concerning the uh, 2005 uh, uh, cost, cost of capital. And, and if we want to go further and be interested in being uh, uh, consistent, uh, I'd point out that, uh, you know, that, that the AAR attacked uh, Mr. Crowley's original analysis for the 2005 cost of capital uh, using CAPM as being completely uh, unrealistic and fundamentally flawed. And, and, and now they seem to, uh, to uh, find some uh, endorsement of their position in it. The board use of the CAPM model, as, uh, as proposed in the NPRM, comes up with a cost of capital 8.5%, which is, which is much lower than uh, what's been used in the past, certainly much lower than what the uh, AAR believes should be used. And also, I the representative from Atticus uh, before said that the investors want at least 12% if they're going to invest in the railroads. Now, many of your companies in the, in the Western Coal uh, traffic league, the utilities, etc. Many of them are regulated industries. Would they find 8.5% uh, of a cost of capital to be adequate in order to attract investors? Uh, 
Um, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, Dan, if you, um, if, if you give me a moment, uh, Mr. Fapp will, will pull up a, uh, a slide. And, and this is what I alluded to uh, briefly in, in the testimony. And uh, I don't know if it's fully uh, legible, but, uh, but Mr. Motes, in, in, in his written testimony, had shown that the uh, average uh, 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 ROE for the electric utilities in, in 2005 was uh, was 10.75 percent. You know, that's the average of values prescribed by the uh, by the state public utility commissions and and what are, I believe, the uh, the retail rate cases for electric utilities, and uh, and and that reflects an equity cap ratio of 56.73 percent, meaning that uh, equity is a little less than than 50 percent of, of the total capital structure. Uh, in contrast, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, railroads um, have um, had had an, had have an equity of 69.6 percent. And if and if you read Doctor any of Doctor Myers' statements where he criticized. Uh, the Western Coal Traffic League's comments on the capital structure. He said that it's it's a wash because as as you increase the uh, leverage, as you increase the debt, the um, the cost of equity goes up, and that's exactly what the calculation with a uh, uh, levered beta does. So uh, what what we did uh, on on this uh, sheet, and, and and we'll submit it later, and and and, and submit it to the board to be posted, is is we took that 10.75 uh, percent. Um, we used um, uh, the the the, uh, the STB's uh, inputs on, on the risk-free rate and, and the equity risk premium, and then we unlevered the beta, and then we we levered it back to uh, to reflect uh, the railroad's capital structure. And the cost of equity we came up with was uh, uh, eight eight point four seven percent. Again, the, the figure that the uh, that the board calculated. So, um, so uh, doing the same calculations and just and just adjusting the equity goes from this supposed high, higher figure for uh, for the uh, um, electric utilities to, uh, to to the figure that uh, that uh, the board calculated for the railroads. Now, if, if anyone's curious, um, I also did the calculation using a, a seven seven point one percent equity risk premium. Of course, you, you get lower betas to come out at the uh, at the 10.75 percent, but uh, but the figure I, I yeah I, I came up with was was about 8.61 8 percent. So it's so it's not terribly uh, uh, sensitive to that uh, uh, at all. So the answer is if if you give the electric utilities the same capital structure, uh, it it becomes the uh, the, the same figure. Okay. Um, are the railroads more or less risky than the uh, electric utilities, or which have a guaranteed rate of return? Um, I don't think that the electric utilities would uh, would would, uh, would claim to have a guaranteed rate of return, particularly a, a, a target rate of return in which their rates are adjusted to try to meet anyway. Right. Well, I, I point out that uh, they also have uh, uh, demanding demanding uh, prudency reviews. They also have a meaningful used and 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 useful test. They also have a uh, a duty to uh, to provide reliability that, that far surpasses what. Uh, what the what the railroad industry uh, supplies at, 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 at least to its uh, uh, to at least to its uh, coal uh, customers. So um, you know I would think if 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 you want to look at the beta, which which is the, I think the relevant measure of of risk uh, when when you're dealing with with cap M, um, then then I think they come in fairly close. I, I think we have put in data earlier that that indicated the railroads what was a little bit less, but then you have to start looking at levered versus versus uh, uh, unlevered betas. Um, I'd also mention, if, if I may, that, uh, you know, that the Atticus uh, uh, capital presentation of, of risk was interesting, but it, was, it, it certainly did not correspond to, uh, to the distinction between systematic and unsystematic risk and diversi diversifiable and non-diversifiable risk that, that's captured in CAPM. Thank you. I make one comment on your question. Utilities don't have to transport chlorine. That's true, although utilities uh, do have uh, some of the chlorine and some of these other hazmats at the plant in order to work, operate the scrubbers, so I suppose. Right. It, it, oh, it, what you have at the scrubbers, if you start looking in, in, in the transformers, you get uh, 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 polyvinyl chloride and spills, and, 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 and they have their own uh, 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 hazmat hazards a, as well. So, um, 
know, it's, you know, there's, you know, there are those sorts of risks uh, 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 everywhere. And I should also mention that uh, some of those utilities have, have nuclear power plants if we want to start talking about risk, too. Both points are well taken. Thank you. Vice Chairman Buttrey, questions? I've just got a couple. Uh, Mr. Rosenberg, uh, I, re I recognize that your association is uh, comprised of a pretty diverse group of companies around the country, and they don't all, probably always check in with you in advance when they uh, submit various filings and their different matters uh, before their state regulators and other regulators. But the record seems to indicate some in inconsistencies in that vein. I'm sure you came today prepared to address that since it's in the record. Can, can you do so for us as to why several of your members would argue basically contrary to what you're arguing today in other, in other regulatory venues? And is there a, just how, how can we kind of reconcile that? Well, I, I haven't reviewed all of the filings. I suspect uh, 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 parties that are regulated uh, argue all sorts of things in, uh, in, 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 in the regulatory proceedings as the AAR has done here. Um, you know, what, what I would point out again is, is uh, let's, let, let's look at where those decisions have actually come out. And again, that's the 10.75 percent with, with, with about a 50-50 uh, 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 capital structure. Let's, let, let's take those numbers that the regulators came up, let's adjust it to reflect uh, the railroad's capital structure, and again, you come out at, at, at the same figure that the board uh, uh, derived uh, uh, on its own acting in, independently. Now, Mr. Motes, uh, I, I had a little trouble. I, well, I don't know if I had trouble, but I found your testimony interesting. I, if, if I could summarize it, and I realize this isn't exactly what you said, but it, it, you seem to say you weren't, uh, there, there, there isn't as much agreement in the record as uh, others, including me, uh, might, might think or surmise, uh, that you're not sure that uh, you have any problem with the um, pre-existing uh, cost of capital uh, uh, calculation methodology, that that might be okay or not, given, given the record before. So I think there was some vagueness there. You weren't really ready to necessarily commit to moving beyond that. You did suggest, if I followed you correctly, that, that uh, uh, supplementing um, a CAPM approach with a multi-stage DCF, uh, if we were to tr try a new approach, would probably be uh, uh, preferable to not doing so. But then you were quick to say that there, there's not enough information on the record to even get close to doing that right now. I, that combined with, with something I heard one of your expert witnesses say about the record not being adequate, I started having visions of us being together uh, every Christmas time for years to come. Is that what you're uh, after here? You just enjoy this uh, so much you want to relive it? We had a hearing last January. We've had a the record is voluminous, and I would expect a little more, I guess, if you, if you do feel that the a, um, a certain type of cash, a free cash flow oriented uh, three-stage DCF model is useful. I would have expected you to come to the, here today to talk about it in detail, um, not to say, well, it's, uh, the record's just not, you know, it would be nice, but the record's not s sufficient, so we just really need to guess, just drift along uh, as we have. Uh, do you have anything to say to that? Uh, I do, and I'd love to see you every uh, Christmas, but not, for, not here. <laughs> uh, Perhaps my opening remarks were so broad-ranging and so fast I wasn't as precise as I should have been. We recognize, and I thought I said this, we the AAR recognize that the single-stage DCF you know, may have outlived its usefulness in this environment. I reference now again Professor Myers and Dr. Stangles reminding us where we were 20 or 25 years ago when the wheel turns. In that regard, we feel very strongly that the CAPM alone, even with the inputs corrected and made appropriate, as we have discussed here today and in our testimony, it would be inappropriate to adopt that as the sole standard. We think that the other standard should include ADCF, not the one you're using today, some sort of properly implemented multi-stage DCF. With all due respect, I did not come here today prepared to address in detail multi-stage DCFs, in part because I'm a lawyer, not an economist, and the questions about the multi-stage DCF showed up in your notice for this hearing a week ago. They weren't in the notice of proposed rulemaking. I wrote down two comments today that Professor Hodder made because I agreed with him. And Professor Hodder, if I get a word or two wrong here, I apologize, but I think I'll get the spirit of what you said. At one point he said, we didn't view the board's mandate to be to explore the best multi-stage DCF model. And later on in his testimony, he said, if the DCF is used as more than a check, it needs to be looked at more carefully. We agree with that. 
We agree with that. And no, we're not trying to delay the proceeding unduly, but I would point out that the notice just came out in August. Yes, we had a hearing last February to start talking about the issue because of WCTL submissions and ex parte 558. Uh, you had a witness in February from the Federal Reserve who told you about the amount of time that institution took to analyze CAPM and all the implications for its purpose, which, at least in my view, while important, were not as profoundly important as the purpose here. My recollection is they were using it to price certain services that the Fed provided to its member banks, and they kind of wanted to have a, a, you know, a fairly accurate number, but it's not the same as a number that's going to have the impact on rates and revenue adequacy that your determination here would have, which is my way of saying if we need to take a little more time, we can do this quickly. I'm not talking about another year, but I, if we need to take a little more time, and I think we do for the parties, all the parties, to submit directed testimony towards a proper, properly conceived and implemented multi-stage DCF to be used with the CAPM, we ought to do it. And to be very precise in response to the question, about going to court and things being arbitrary and capricious, uh, my view would be that if you don't do it, there's some real risk that just going to the CAPM alone, uh, I, I'm not in a position to say here today we wouldn't contest that. Mr. DeMichael or Mr. Rosenberg, do you care to uh, speak to that issue of whether or not the record's ready to move forward uh, after today, or do we need to go through some type of additional process or... It seems to me if the board is going to adopt a CAPM and uh, 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 and uh, if they use a multi-stage to DCF as a check, the, uh, uh, the record is uh, uh, clearly sufficient. It's, uh, it seems to me what, what the AAR has done here is try to defend a single stage to DCF for a long period of time. Having been forced to move, um, they then have not put in uh, uh, evidence that the board needs if they're going to do a uh, multi-stage to DCF as part of the uh, uh, actual standard, and I, and I think um, that uh, to say the board should uh, 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 wait further uh, in that to circumstances uh, is just really not uh, correct. It seems pretty clear that the single stage DCF the board has right now is not accurate, and the board needs to ma make the change. Mr. Rosenberg? Um, several points. Uh, right now, the, uh, the board is using a, uh, this most recent cost of capital is 12.2%. Uh, the, the, the railroad representatives say, say they use 10, 10 to 12%. The figure is uh, too high. Um, it, it ought to be addressed. It, it shouldn't be left uh, lingering. Um, the, uh, the proposal put forward in the, in the notice of proposed rulemaking was, was, was to use the uh, CAPM. I, I think we've uh, we said enough. I think the record indicates that that it's a reasonable calculation, and it would be responsible to use it. Um, we we like others think that uh, using a multi-stage uh, uh, DCF provides a reasonable check, and indeed the uh, the analysis we we put forward co confirms the uh, reasonableness of of the CAPM approach. So so we think it's ready. And again, um, you know, to, to the extent the uh, AAR has something more to bring to the table, uh, they should have brought it forward in the written comments, or they should have brought it back forward last uh, 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 December, so we could have uh, considered it for, for the February hearing. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, the, it's in their interest to, uh, to uh, drag th this out, but uh, um, they, they shouldn't be indulged beyond the point they have been, frankly. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mulvey? Uh, a couple more questions. Um, Mr. Motes, um, can you give us some examples of agencies or organizations that calculate the cost of capital using the DCF model, your multi-stage model that you're recommending here, uh, that is using the uh, free cash flow instead of dividends uh, with a growth rate, growth rate that tapers down to the long-term growth rate of the economy? I can't do that sitting here, but I would welcome the opportunity to try to submit that to you. I know the FERC uses, as you do, a uh -huh. DCF model. I don't know about all the components that you just addressed, but I think you said earlier you had a few additional questions for the, some of the experts. I maybe do, and the, maybe we can include that in the list of questions because I feel unprepared and not qualified to try to respond to that. Okay. Um, we also use uh, we, we use a 10-year period to try and forecast the the, uh, the market uh, the free, the free, the, uh, the risk-free rate of return. And um, 
even though it's uh, it's uh, typical to use a shorter term rate. But the WCATL and the AAR both suggest that we use a 20-year uh, Treasury bond rate to calculate the mark doing the, the risk-free premium. But it's my understanding that we don't have Treasury issues of 20 years that go all the way back. Um, well, how would you fill in the gap for all those periods when there weren't tre when there weren't 20 year treasuries out there to use for calculating the um, first group premium? Uh, my understanding, and and again, it was probably better directed to 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 the economist, is is that you can look at for for those period of time for that period of time, I think it was less less than uh, 10 years. Um, I believe you, you can look at the yield to maturity on the 30-year bonds that were still outstanding and come up with a uh, with, with a decent figure. Um, there, there was some question as as to whether or not uh, you know that that the calcu that the board had done uh, the uh, the calculation correctly in its, in its work papers and and trying to figure that out was was uh, compromised by uh, or or impeded a bit by the use of, of the crisp uh, uh, data. Um, I think the view of of of, uh, of our experts was that it was done properly I think the AR disagreed but it, but it is but there is a calculation that, that you can do and you come up with with uh, with a reasonable surrogate for what the figure is thank you do you have anything more yeah, I'm sorry. I, we think that 20 year T bond data is generally available back to uh, the 20s but uh, and professor Myers just advised me of that but again let us well, okay include that response <clears throat> we were told that there were some gaps in the data there was some time periods which the one when there weren't 20 year bonds available so We'll check, we'll check that out. If they're also. nodding, yes, that may be true. We'll, we'll, okay, we'll thank you. Know. Thank you very much. Vice Chairman Butcher, any questions? Uh, as we'll, we'll get to ready to wrap up momentarily. I do have a couple of uh, items I wanted to mention. We will um, follow up, so stay tuned with an, an appropriate order uh, on uh, what, if any, um, follow-up evidence uh, uh, we might need here and, and also uh, when the record will close. At this point, the record will remain open for... Uh, uh, Commissioner Mulvey and others to um, submit questions uh, and we'll follow up with an appropriate order. Uh, we do have a, 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 a special um, occasion to note today. Uh, it's a one of uh, it's bittersweet to the board. Uh, one of our longest serving uh, leaders uh, from the career ranks uh, who is a, a very high profile and valued uh, person at these hearings, uh, Vernon Williams, our secretary, and he doesn't know I'm going to say this so he's probably not happy, but he, he <laughs> He's actually announced his retirement on January 3rd, and unless uh, any of you in the room or others shock us with something, an emergency, <laughs> but this will be our last hearing uh, uh, between now and January 3rd, and so it will be the last time we have this, this venue to uh, recognize uh, Vernon. He um, joined the ICC back in 1972, uh, where he worked, uh, when he worked in the Office of Proceedings uh, until 1984. Uh, he did a short uh, stint in the private sector returned in 1993 as an assist, associate secretary and was appointed secretary of the ICC in 1994. Vernon has the distinction of being the last secretary of the ICC and the first secretary of the Service Transportation Board. Uh, he also was appointed to the position of the Equal Employment Opportunity Director in 2002. He has served the ICC and the STB for 26 years and we appreciate his service and wish him well in retirement and uh, just wanted to acknowledge that and thank you Vernon. Uh, here while we uh, are here together at a hearing and I'm sure my board members uh, colleagues uh, join me in wishing you all the best in, in retirement. Thank you very much sir. Very, I enjoy serving under you. Thank you. And with that this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.